Hi everyone, welcome to this video where we're just going to talk through chest x-ray interpretation. As with all these radiology videos, this is aimed at the non-specialist, I'm not a radiologist myself. So we're just going to go through basic interpretation of chest x-rays, look at a systematic approach to analysing them and how to describe abnormalities and then we'll go through a few examples at the end. So starting with the basic stuff then, as we can see by that image, air is very dark on chest x-rays and metal or contrast is, is very white and then everything else is sort of in the middle. So we can work out the likely tissue or substance based on the colour of objects on chest x-ray. So it's something very white, i.e. metal or, or bone, so that has a high density, or we might say that's a pacification, or hyperdense. And then if something's very dark or black, then we say that's got a low density, so hypodense. Now when you're looking at chest x-rays in, in practice or on placement, it's really important that we make sure that we get those patient details as well, make sure that we check it's the right patient, it's the right time, it's the right date. As you're probably aware, lots of patients will have several x-rays, particularly if they're admitted. And so we want to make sure that we're looking at the right x-ray at the right time. And the other thing it's important to do when you're checking the dates and time is also to get previous x-rays, just so you can compare if any abnormalities are new or not. The other thing to check with the technical details is the image projection. As the image shows there, there's a difference in how the radiographer will take the x-ray, depending on whether the x-ray beam is coming anteriorly to posteriorly or whether it's coming posteriorly to anteriorly. Now, the sort of gold standard in inverted commas is a PA x-ray, whereas the AP distorts, particularly the heart, making the heart appear bigger. Another thing to note is whether x-rays are portable or whether they're erect, semi-erect or supine, because that'll just give you additional information about the state of that patient. In terms of image quality, we use the acronym RIP, or sometimes uh, RIPE, RIPE, and that stands for Rotation, Inspiration, Penetration, uh, slash Exposure. Now, when we're assessing these, ideally we want an image that isn't rotated, that has good inspiration and adequate penetration. And those are the things we're checking for there. So the red circles indicate where the clavicle heads are. We want to make sure that the spinous processes are in the middle of, of the two clavicle heads. Inspiration-wise, I've, I've indicated the, the ribs there with the green lines. Ideally, you want the fifth, sixth, or seventh anterior rib to intersect the diaphragm in the midclavicular line. And that's demonstrated with rib six going through the diaphragm in the midclavicular line. And then with penetration, we want to make sure that the spine is visible behind the heart. Now, in reality, in practice, you can easily manipulate the exposure of the penetration, normally with a right click and just by dragging around the image. But with static pictures that you're going to see in this and probably in your exams, it's important to comment on the penetration. So the example here shows a poorly inspired film, i.e. there's not enough anterior ribs visible, and there's certainly not the fifth, sixth or seventh dissecting the, the diaphragm in the midclavicular line. The second example here shows a poorly rotated film. So again, the red circles highlight the, the clavicle heads, and as you can see, in the middle of the, the two clavicle heads, there isn't a spinous process. And as you might be able to appreciate, that sort of distorts the heart position um, and can make interpretation difficult. So let's have a look now then at how to, how to go through chest x-ray interpretation. And there's loads of different approaches. I would recommend that you, you find one that works for you. And this is one that works for me, it's A, B, C, D, E, because I'm relatively simple and I like repetition. So I use A, B, C, D, E when I assess a patient and I use A, B, C, D, E when I'm looking at chest x-rays. So again, that's airways, breathing, circulation, disability slash diaphragm in this case, and everything else, which is essentially the bone and soft tissue. So when we're looking at A, when we're looking at airways, particularly we're interested in the trachea and the hyla. So the numbered image there, so number one is the trachea, and number two is the carina, and uh, three are the hyla bilaterally. Well, obviously we want to check for tracheal deviation. Now this is difficult if you've got a rotated film, so again it's just highlighting the importance of going through that RIP. But if you do have a deviated trachea, it's often helpful to work out if the trachea has been pushed or pulled. If it's been pushed, it's going to suggest that there's increased pressure in one side of the chest, in one hemithorax, pushing the trachea away from that side. Whereas other, otherwise, you might have a volume loss in one side of the, of the chest, which pulls the trachea towards that side. Now, it's important to check that the hyla are ideally a similar size, similar sort of shape, um, and have the same sort of density. Uh, for those you aren't aware, that the hyla is essentially a combination of the bronchi, pulmonary veins, and pulmonary arteries. Now moving on to B, breathing. Don't talk about lobes when you're looking at chest x-rays. We use the term zones because the lobes will overlap. So you have upper zone, mid zone, and lower zone. And essentially what you're doing is you check both sides, looking for any obvious differences. Ideally, there should be both similar density. When you're looking at breathing, particularly in the mid zones, you can sometimes see the fissures between the, between the lobes. 
If they're highlighted, that's probably because they're going to be filled with fluid, sometimes infection, but generally fluid. The other things to look out for when breathing are the pleura. So ideally, we want to see lung markings reaching the edge of the thoracic wall. If they're not, that's probably due to a pneumothorax, which will also be suggested by an increased darkness on the pathological side. And the other anatomical area we want to check are the costophrenic angles, which are highlighted by the number four there. They should be nice and sharp, as they are in that, in that image there. If they're not, they're, again, probably going to be filled with fluid or infection. And moving on to C, circulation. The image is highlighted, the things that we're paying attention to here, but particularly we're looking at the cardiothoracic border. Now, ideally, to assess the cardiothoracic border, you should be looking at a, a PA x-ray. As I mentioned before, the, the AP distorts the size of the heart. And if the heart is greater than 50% of the thoracic diameter, then that's considered pathological, suggestive of cardiomegaly. The red and blue arrows are just there to highlight how we work out the cardiothoracic ratio. Otherwise, we can visualise the right atrium, which is the orange line there, and the left ventricle, which is the green line there. Now, ideally, they should be smooth. They should be relatively well-defined. If they're not, that is more likely to suggest actually overlying pathology in the lung rather than an issue with the heart. And then otherwise, the key things to pick up on are the, are the aortic knuckle and the descending thoracic aorta. Again, that, that's highlighted with the purple bit right at the top, which is the stent knuckle, as the aorta arches over the, the left main bronchus. If you've got a widened mediastinum, that may be due to an aortic pathology, i.e. an aneurysm. Aneurysms are generally relatively smooth. If you've got a sort of more patchy abnormality in the area of the aorta, that's more likely to be due to overlying lung pathology. Moving on to, to D, the disability slash diaphragm. Really, we're looking at the, the hemi diaphragms here. They should be relatively smooth. The right is often a little higher than the left. Sometimes you get a hemidiaphragm that's significantly raised, and that's important to comment on. But just remembering the spectrum of normal, i.e. as shown in that image, the right is slightly higher than the left. And when you're looking at the diaphragms, just have a quick look below as well, because you may well see a stomach bubble, and that's highlighted in red there, which isn't of any clinical concern. And then finally, in E, you're looking at soft tissues. So you're looking at soft tissues around the neck, the breasts and the nipples, which may be misinterpreted for the lung pathology. The bones, you might see some abnormalities in the bones, including the, the humerus and the clavicles. Make sure to comment on those. And again, best practice, mention the presence of tubes, drains, oxygen masks, etc. So we're just going to go through some examples now. What I'd probably recommend is that you pause the video just after you've got the vignette and try and interpret it yourself before we go through it together. So this first example is a 70-year-old patient who has a previous lung cancer who presents with chest pain, and we've taken that chest x-ray there. Now, remembering our systematic approach, so we're looking at RIP. So rotation, inspiration, and penetration all appear adequate. Airways-wise, we notice that actually the trachea is deviated to the left, and we can see the clavicle heads quite clearly, suggesting it's not a rotated film. So we can be relatively confident that the trachea is deviated to the left. If we go on to look at breathing then, there's several abnormalities to note here. So firstly, my eye is drawn to the, the slight loss of, of lung volume in the, in the left side there. There appears to be less lung markings. And also the left hyla appears slightly bigger than the right and does appear to be displaced. All of those things suggest that the trachea and the hyla are being pulled away, probably because of that loss of volume. On the right, there's some fluid in the horizontal fissure. That's that thin white line in about the middle of the chest on the right. And the costophrenic angles have just been missed off. They're barely visible on this film, so it's difficult to comment on those. Nothing really to pick up on C. V looks normal, and nothing remarkable to pick up on E. So all in all, I suspect that patient's had some sort of lung resection, and that's caused the trachea to be deviated to the left. And there's a small amount of fluid in the horizontal fissure. You can't really see the right costophrenic angle, but there may well be a small amount of edema present. So moving on then. Another vignette, you've got a 62-year-old patient who presents with cough productive of green sputum and fevers. Now, as a small exam tip here, even before you look at the x-ray, you kind of know what the diagnosis is. So if someone presents with a cough, fevers, and they're bringing up sputum, they have a chest infection. So you can use that to aid your interpretation as well. Always put the x-ray into the context of the patient. But again, if we go through RIP, rotation is good, inspiration is adequate and penetration appears okay as well. We can just about see the vertebra through the heart. Airway-wise, looks okay. The trachea is possibly slightly deviating towards the, the inferior aspect, but is generally straight. The obvious abnormality on, on B is that there's a pacification in the right lower zone. There's some more prominent lung markings on that right side as well that may be fluid or infection-driven. And there's some small circular pacifications visible in, in both the hyla regions, particularly on the right which are more likely to be lymph nodes because of their circularness. C, D and E look pretty normal. The like diagnosis there is a, a right lower zone pneumonia. The next one is an 85-year-old patient who presents with worsening peripheral edema. Now, again, using the, the tip from the last case, if someone's presenting with worsening 
peripheral edema, they may well be worsening edema on their chest. So that, again, is just going to help us tailor what we're looking for in terms of abnormalities. And again, going through RIP, it's not rotated, inspiration's adequate, penetration's okay as well. Airways look okay. Breathing-wise, particularly in the lower zones, there appears to be a, fa- a pacification both sides. You can't see the costophrenic angles there. They're blunted, and there appears to be a bit of a meniscus sign, so a smooth meniscus shape there, which would be in keeping with bilateral pleural effusions. Now, you can't quite see the apex of the heart, so it's difficult to fully assess the cardiothoracic border, but you can kind of appreciate that it sort of disappears and is obscured by that left pleural effusion. So therefore, you suspect there's probably some cardiomegaly. A, because the image suggests that, but B, so does the patient. So if they've got worsening peripheral edema, they've got bilateral pleural effusions. That's in keeping with someone who does have heart failure, and they're likely to have a degree of cardiomegaly. d and are pretty unremarkable there. So your diagnosis there is, is worsening heart failure, evidenced by pleural effusions and, and likely cardiomegaly. So next, we have a 25-year-old patient who presents with sudden onset chest pain and breathlessness. Now, if we go through our rotation, inspiration, penetration, we look at rotation, we can know actually that the left clavicle head is just overlapping the, the spine, whereas the right one, there's a bit of gap between the spine. So it's a mildly rotated film. Airways appear okay. The trachea, again, might <coughs> might appear slightly rotated uh, to the right, but that's probably because of the mild rotation that we noticed. When we're looking at the breathing, the obvious abnormality is the increased increased darkness in the left side of the chest. And we can't track the lung markings to the border of the chest wall. So that's going to suggest a pneumothorax. And that's actually quite a large pneumothorax. See D and E look pretty normal. So diagnosis there is a, is a left-sided pneumothorax with a slightly rotated film. And that's an important thing to note that although the film is rotated, and i.e. it's not a perfect chest x-ray, it actually doesn't dissuade us from the diagnosis. We don't really need to repeat that chest x-ray because we have a diagnosis. We know that patient's going to need a chest strain. So though it's technically not a perfect x-ray, still helpful diagnostically. Next, we have a 38-year-old patient who presents with weight loss and night sweats. Now, again, remembering those tips from before, that's just going to help us focus down on our interpretation. RIP appear adequate. Breathing-wise, when we're comparing both zones, we notice that when we get to the, the mid-zone, there's a relatively smooth increase of in a pacification on the right side of the chest. And it appears essentially that the aspect of the right or right hyalur area suggesting it's probably going to be a mediastinal mass of, of some kind. The other thing to note are the two dots, which are essentially nipple markers. So sometimes radiographers will put those on to try and prevent the nipples uh, obscuring images, particularly in, in the cases where we're looking for masses like this. See, D and E look pretty normal. So the diagnosis there is a mediastinal mass. That's going to need appropriate referral to an oncologist for sampling and further imaging. Next, we have a 75-year-old patient who presents with sudden onset of breathlessness after waking up. Now, when we're going through our rotation, inspiration, and penetration, it's difficult to see the clavicle heads because they've been slightly missed, but the film doesn't appear grossly rotated. And equally, it's slightly difficult to see the, the vertebra through the heart. So exposure isn't ideal either. Now, the airways look okay. The trachea is nice and central. Breathing-wise, there's a few abnormalities to pick up on. Firstly, there's increased density in the mid and lower zones, and that's in what we would describe as a back wing distribution. There are some curly B lines present. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. When we're looking at the costophrenic angles, they're both blunted. When we move on to C, we notice that there's cardiomegaly and the heart itself appears large and bulky. But otherwise, D and E of what we can see appear okay. So the diagnosis there, that's a pretty good example of a pulmonary edema x-ray. One of the key diagnostic features are curly B lines. So these are prominent markings between the the pulmonary lobules, i.e. the the pulmonary lobules being essentially the, the, the alveoli, ducts and sacs. But curly B lines are present when essentially you have a high capillary wedge pressure, and that's commonly seen in, in pulmonary edema. Moving on, we have a 37-year-old patient who presents with an inseptic shock with a two-day history of abdominal pain that was suddenly worse this morning. Now, again, that's just going to point us towards looking at certain things when we go through our interpretation, but not forgetting our rotation, inspiration, and penetration. Rotation appears good. Inspiration is, is adequate, and exposure is good as well. Breathing-wise, the, the lungs look relatively clear. There's a few slightly prominent Aspects in the high level, which may well be lymph nodes, may well be normal for the patient. Circulation-wise, the heart looks okay. The right side of the border isn't as crisp as it could be. When we're looking at D, the obvious abnormality is, uh, is some air under the right hemidiaphragm. And also, we see that air tracks to the inferior aspect of the, of the cardiac border as well. When we're looking below the diaphragm, there's also some prominent bowel loops there. That suggests a, a small degree of obstruction. And the other abnormality to note is that there is tube or some sort of line which appears to enter from the left side of the neck and sit just above the carina. That's probably going to be a central line. 
For the diagnosis, there is a likely perforated bowel, which is going to need some pretty urgent input from the surgeons. So next, we have an 11-year-old who presents with a cough, fever and breathlessness. Now, when we're going through rotation, inspiration and penetration, the clavicle heads are slightly difficult to see because they're obscured by what appears to be metalwork. Inspiration is good, particularly if we look at the, if we count on the ribs on the left side of the chest there. And penetration is good as well. We can see the vertebra through the heart. Airways wise, we look okay there. Breathing wise, there's, there's a loss of volume to the right upper zone. And there appears to be deformity to the ribs. They're not particularly uniform or the sort of the correct anatomical shape. But otherwise, the lung fields themselves appear to be clear. The heart itself appears of a normal size. The diaphragms look unremarkable. There is some bowel gas below the left hemidiaphragm. That's probably non non specific and is probably not clinically relevant. When we're looking at E though, there's quite a few things to pick up on. So obviously there's metal work down the down the spine, quite a lot of metal work. We can just see some humeral growth plates bilaterally as well, which is in keeping with the age of the child. So if we tile that together, the metal work suggests that the spine's been fixed, probably due to scoliosis. The deformities to the rib are probably because of a previous scoliosis impacting on the on the right side of the chest. But there's no cause for this child's cough, fever and breathlessness noted on that x-ray. And finally then we have a 75-year-old patient who has COPD who presents for a follow-up chest x-ray six weeks after treatment for a confirmed pneumonia. So rotation is good. Inspiration, the chest is hyper-expanded so that we can tell that by the hemidiaphragms being flattened, suggesting that the patient is consistently breathing a lot. And it's difficult to appreciate the the anterior ribs, but it looks like it's over-inspired, which is probably not the patient's fault. But exposure appears okay. Airways look central, and there's no obvious abnormality there. Breathing-wise, when we're comparing both zones, they both appear to be equal. And when we're looking at the lower zone, there does appear to be slightly increased pacification on, on the right, but there's also matched on the left. And if you look at the shape of it, it's probably going to be breast tissue. So there's two sort of breast-like areas that are giving that slightly increased pacification there. So that's probably breast tissue. That's probably not infection. And if we just check the costophrenic angles, we can see there's a bit of blunting to the right side, particularly the left side looks better than the right. So there may, be, may well be a bit of residual infection in that uh, costophrenic angle, or possibly a little bit of fluid. Heart-wise, the heart appears small. Diaphragms, as we mentioned, are flattened, but there's no other abnormalities to mention. And soft tissues, bones, etc., all appear normal. So diagnosis, there may well be a residual bit of infection on that right costophrenic angle. It'd be important to compare it to the, the previous x-ray to see if any of those changes are new. But otherwise, that's basically everything I wanted to go through. So just a few quick summary points then. As ever, be systematic, be thorough. Don't forget the simple stuff. Don't forget rotation, inspiration, penetration. Don't forget your patient details, date and time. They're really crucial to make sure that you're looking at the right the right x-ray at the right time for the right patient. As with all of these interpretation skills, look at as many x-rays as possible. When you're on placement, when you're out in practice, just look at as many x-rays as possible. Try to start to appreciate the spectrum of normal as well, because that'll just help your interpretation skills. As ever, put the image into the clinical context of the patient in front of you, and also use that clinical context to help your interpretation skills, help guide which abnormalities you should be looking for.